From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. Okay, folks, thank you very much for tuning to our channel this evening. I want to talk about hepatitis B vaccine. And I want to start with a recap of foundational principles. Hepatitis E and A and E are the most recognized causes of acute hepatitis, whereas hepatitis B, C, and D are the most recognized causes of chronic hepatitis. That's an important point. Hepatitis A and E are the most recognized causes of acute hepatitis, whereas B, C, and D cause the most recognized causes of viral uh, chronic hepatitis. And A and E are caused by fecal oral transmission. And A and E doesn't cause chronic infection, whereas B, C, and D are acquired percutaneously and all can result in chronic infection. So B, C, and D are acquired percutaneously and B, C, and D all can cause chronic infection. Hepatitis D can only occur in a host already infected with hepatitis B. So those are the important things. And let me tell you some foundational points before we go into particular details about uh, this important vaccine. There are two types of immunity. Active immunity and passive immunity, we are taught this even in microbiology class in medical school. Active immunity is when we are in contact with foreign antigens like microorganisms and uh, they have clinical and subclinical infection and immunization will happen. Like for example, a, uh, an exposure to microbial product like toxins or toxoids. So in all these cases, the host actively produces immune response consisting of antibodies and activating helper and cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So the active immunity is the main immunity and it is long term, but the major disadvantage is, is slow onset, especially the primary response. Active immunity is so it is long-term and slow onset, whereas passive immunity is the resistance based on antibodies preformed in another host. So you're bringing antibodies from another host and giving to this person who has tetanus or botulism or rabies. And the, anti, uh, the, the, the antibodies are immediately available. They are preformed and uh, certain viruses like rabies, hepatitis B, you are injecting them at the same time, like you give them the vaccine. So the other passive immunities like uh, IgG coming from the mother to the baby in pregnancy or IgA that comes from the mother to the baby through the uh, breast milk, those passive immunities are also helpful. But the passive immunities disadvantage is it's a short lifespan and sometimes even hypersensitivity reactions can occur to the globulins from another species. So you see the baby can get antibodies from the mother, but it is only short term, like six months. So as human beings, especially in the medical field, we take both. There is no, there are, there is no rules here. You take your passive and active immunity and you combine them to get the cl good clinical response. And uh, so the vaccines, which, are, which come under active immunity, they give us that long-term immunity and resistance against uh, these uh, diseases. And in, in diseases like uh, rabies, for example, a patient comes to you after a dog bite and you give immunoglobulins into one hand and uh, also the rabies vaccine to the other hand. Otherwise, if you give at the same site, those uh, counterproductive. So you give in the different one arm, you give immunoglobulins into the other arm, you give the vaccine. 
So you make the best of both the passive and active immunity here. So those are the main foundational concepts I wanted to tell you here. Because without those foundations, you don't understand what is going to come. So like rabies in hepatitis B, uh, you, in, in, the other interesting thing is like in hepatitis B, you can actually give vaccine after the exposure. For all these diseases you give before the exposure, but for hepatitis B or rabies, you can give after the exposure. Why? The incubation period is long. Because the incubation period is long, you still have time to give you a vaccine and produce active immunity in these patients. So for example, if a patient comes with a needle stick injury, you can give hepatitis B vaccine to that person because, because of the long immunity period, this person uh, can produce active antibodies against the virus uh, uh, due to the stimulation of this vaccine. So that's a very interesting point, especially for me. So that's why we give hepatitis B vaccine even in the post-exposure period because of the long incubation period. So active immunity and uh, passive immunity. Active immunity can be induced either by live viruses or uh, a killed virus. Some vaccines such as the hepatitis B vaccine, they contain purified viral proteins and are often called subunit vaccine. So hepatitis B virus vaccine is a subunit vaccine because it is not a live virus or killed virus. It is just the viral protein. So you say there is no viral replication here, just like a killed vaccine. So it has only a viral protein, HBSAG. That's why it is called a subunit vaccine. There is no viral replication and that's a good thing. And many people get confused uh, with all these details about the hepatitis B, surface antigen, antibodies and all. But if you remember the anatomy here, it would be easy to go through. The virus has a surface antigen and a core antigen. And if a person comes to you and has antibodies to both surface antigen and core antigen, then what do you say? That person is infected with the actual virus. But the vaccine, as I said, the vaccine has anti-HB, sorry, HBSAG antigen. So if a person comes to you with antibodies to HBSAG, then you can say this person has vaccine-induced immunity. So you see, it's very simple if you remember what is in each. The vaccine has HBSAG antigen and the virus has both surface antigen and core antigen. So if a person comes to you and you take their hepatitis panel and you find out antibodies to the surface antigen and core antigen, then what, do you, what are you looking at? Probably this person was exposed to the actual virus itself. So you say this person is infected with the virus. And if a person comes with uh, antibodies to HBSAG, now wait a minute, he has antibodies only to HBSAG. He doesn't have antibodies to the core antigen like HBC. So because he doesn't have antibodies to core antigen and has only antibodies to against the surface antigen, we can say this person is not exposed to the virus. Then how did he get the antibodies against HBSAG? Probably he got HBSAG. And what has HBSAG? The vaccine has HBSAG. So this person, he has got vaccine-induced immunity. So you see, go first think about uh, like that, like systematic thinking helps you to remember these things. So those are the important things I wanted to tell you. Remember, the hepatitis B vaccine is very important vaccine all over the world because both developing nations and developed nations, because the risk 
is increasing like it's a sexually transmitted percutaneous and there is unfortunately there is increased use of uh, intravenous drugs all over the world because of this increased use of intravenous drugs hepatitis B is increasing that's why it's very important when you get patients with a uh, intravenous drug use that you should recommend hepatitis B vaccine and to tell them that it takes three doses zero one and six months they should come and take the vaccine and whenever you see that they they are at risk population always recommend this vaccine and active immunity passive immunity this anti uh, this vaccine is providing active immunity and it also comes as immunoglobulins like uh, you can also give uh, to an infected person immunoglobulins as passive immunity this is a subunit vaccine and those are the important points i wanted to share with you tonight thank you very much thanks for listening for more medical videos please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site if you are preparing for usmle plab and other medical exams make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations for more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.